Oh, my, my computer said seven. Yeah, I'm showing seven too, so. I hereby call this regular meeting of the City of Bloomington City Council uh, to order for February 11th. Uh, please uh, stand for the pledge in a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance. Thank you very much. Will the clerk please take the attendance roll for this evening? Alderman Fazzini. Present. Alderman Fruin. Here. Alderman Sage. Here. Alderman Milwalamwe. Here. Alderman Stern. Here. Alderman McDade. Here. Alderman Schmidt. Here. Alderman Purcell. Here. Mayor Stockton. Here. Okay, our first order of business this evening is to receive up to five uh, public comments. Um, we actually had nine people apply, so we did a little random drawing up here. The clerk shuffled them and I uh, picked out five. And I'll just do them in the order that, that they were picked. Um, the first is Patty uh, Geske. Uh, is Patty here? And we'd ask that you approach and please give your name again and your address. Hi there. My name is Patty Geske. It's G-E-S-K-E. -E. I live at 1020 East Front Street. Okay, please go ahead, Patty. Okay. I, by living on Front Street, of course, we're concerned with the proposition that Mr. Shirk has to uh, industrialize the area that is now a green space at the corner of Washington and McClellan. We feel as a contingency in our neighborhood that this could be uh, even more traffic congestion, which I know you have heard before that we've said. We're also concerned with uh, the merchants that would be coming into that apartment dwelling because their uh, the, they're <laughs> delivery people would have to park trucks to unload things and so forth. We're concerned about that. And we don't know where extra parking would be if anyone had visitors to any of the set apartments and they're only allowed two spaces each. Uh, we're wondering about the impact it would have not only on traffic, but on schools and particularly on Front Street and McClun Street as well. Uh, that's basically what we wanted to discuss and hope that there have been thorough investigations as far as traffic. We're also concerned about what roads are going to be blocked off when this construction does take place. So, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, the next card is Alton Franklin. And I know you know uh, how this works. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Alton Franklin. I reside at 508 Patterson, Bloomington, Illinois. A number of things on my mind in three minutes is hardly enough to cover them all, but I'm going to do my best. I was uh, confused by the uh, sudden decision, it appears, to uh, table managed competition especially when on February the 5th, Panagraph spoke to uh, an opening that's coming up now for someone to do fundraising for the BCPA. So instead of utilizing a prime opportunity 
to go with something that is most efficiently outsourced, where you provide a certain percentage of the funds raised to the individual or organization that does the fundraising. Instead, we're going to add to the almost $150 million short fund, uh, shortfall with the pension funds. Uh, and especially with regards to the IMRF, since they'll be a municipal employee, and that's only a little north of 30% funded. I am deeply disturbed that uh, when a good opportunity arises, we find something else to do. The other point that I'd like to make is in regards to the appointee for uh, Ward 1. There's one individual that went through the time and effort to get on the ballot and to be suddenly subverted, and that's what it is. It's a usurpation. If somebody stepped in and utilized some kind of influence in order to get there, whether or not it was their resume, don't know, don't care. It's inappropriate. There's one person on the ballot, and no effort was made by the other individual. That, to me, is just wrong. It smacks of political partisanship, and I thought that this city council was nonpartisan. That's the way I've always heard it, but that's not the way it reads. I am growing increasingly disgusted with the things that I'm seeing. We made some minor, prog minor progress for which I lauded the council at another time that I spoke up here. But now we're sliding back into doing things for all the wrong reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alton. Uh, Becky Bowles. Becky, please. Well, the microphone's about right for you, I think. <clears throat> and uh, state your name and address, please. I'm Becky Bowles, and I live at 1018 and a half East Front Street. Please go ahead. Um, many of the residents on, in the area of East Front Grove, McClellan, Washington would like to express a few concerns. We, when we spoke um, at the planning board and zoning board meetings, we didn't have much time to prepare our thoughts, and we are sorry if we emphasize the traffic concerns on Front Street. Um, but over the past month, my neighbors and I have had some time to really examine our neighborhood, and we still have traffic concerns in the area around the proposed property. We know that Washington is a major road in Bloomington. However, the small stretch of road from Colton to the Constitution Trail is a busy area on Washington Street. And there are daily commuters, cement trucks, and buses that use Davis and McClellan as a cut through across Washington. Um, when a car turns left off of McClellan, there's about two car lengths before they get to Davis Street, which doesn't give the driver much reaction time for cars leaving Davis Street. Um, there also isn't a turn lane on Washington for the vehicles that will be turning into the business area. Um, we are concerned with the exits and entrances around the property. We feel that they could cause many accidents and traffic congestion for the area. We also feel that the exits and entrances on McClellan will bring more traffic up Front Street. The additional traffic can make Front Street hazardous for the residents. We would like to ask the council to do a traffic study in the area. We would like um, to ask you to table your decision until a traffic study has been done on Washington and McClellan. And if not, I'd just like my thoughts on the record for the future so that if we need to ask the city to make any street adjustments, like a traffic light on McClellan or parking on one side on Front Street, in the future we can at least refer to these minutes at this meeting. Um, another compromise we are thinking is maybe to reduce the number of ex exits and entrances on McClellan. Um, a few bullet points about McClellan is it's a bus route and a bus stop. The boards had meat shop parks or semi on McClellan during delivery times, which makes the road a one lane during it that time. Um, McClellan is wider at Washington, and then it narrows by four feet as it gets to Front Street. So the street actually narrows in. Cement trucks from Grove cut through McClellan. Traffic from Davis Street cuts through McClellan. Um, there's no tree lawn on McClellan, which means widening it in the future may be an issue. So McClellan, in, in short, it's a small street. So thank you for your time and your listening ears. <laughs> thank you. Uh, 
Um, next person selected is Bruce Meeks. Bruce Meeks? Okay. Yeah, I see you. Bruce Meeks, 14 Bright Street, Bloomington, Illinois. <clears throat> Good evening to the elected officials and fellow citizens. I want to start first by a comment that I never get tired of hearing from a man I consider quite a patriot, even though he's in the entertainment industry. Craig Ferguson says at his show every night, it's a great day for America. I address you tonight with my comments as a longtime resident in the number one ward in Bloomington. After the February 28th council meeting, I had a short discussion with Mayor Stockton. It was clear to me in his remarks at that time and that of others in the room, that he already decided whom was going to be appointed to the vacant, vacated alderman's seat. It has been clearly stated numerous times by the very aldermen and older women present at this meeting that these seats are, are, that they hold are not theirs, but ours, the voters and citizens. Now it seems my intuitive prediction has come true. Even prior to this meeting and prior to getting all the applications or interviewing all the applicants, the decision was made. The course of action laid in and executed. So here we are in Ward 1 pondering what occurred behind closed doors or arranged before the ink was dry on the letter of resignation of our seat, our seat representing us. Of course, we will never see the emails or know those private discussions and private meetings that occurred or didn't occur. I don't know. I don't have a body of evidence. Unless somehow maybe the legal system brings out the details. But instead, this process and how it was predetermined, its unfolding planned events will, for all of history, have the clouds of pondering and doubt. This is not a great day for the voters and residents of the number one ward here in the city of Bloomington. Making the choice of filling the seat with anyone, anyone, I don't support either candidate standing here and I will not support either candidate after I leave here. Anyone that is campaigning to be duly elected is not the right choice for this situation and for this short term of an appointment. But instead, history of this evening will record that this is pure partisan politics. This council is legally formed to be a nonpartisan elected governing body. Instead, we have the same old gerrymandering methods that have been under, uh, the undertow of holding back our city for decades, which, for example, was done, in my opinion, on the redistricting of the wards some months ago. This, in my opinion, has hurt us as urban planning, citizen involvement, and growing a much larger manufacturing business days. That, that's the... Uh, Prove me I'm wrong by your I'm actions trying. and not your words. I would like to note that um, our rules prohibit us from replying to any allegations made um, up here. So that's your free time to say what you... Uh, what you wish. The last speaker this evening is Kate Watson. It's Kate. Kate Watson, 1016 East Front Street, Bloomington, Illinois. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Front Street again, right? I know you're probably tired of hearing about that. What I would like to say is that in regards to the Shark Project, I feel that we, the members of Front Street and the surrounding area, have been painted as the opposition. And we, I want you just to know that we're not opposed to the project per se. What we are is trying to voice our concerns. And I truly feel that we, previously at the different meetings, 
we we didn't really express what our concerns are in a in a way that led led the groups or the boards to believe you know to understand what we were trying to convey. And we're not familiar with the planning commission. We're not familiar with the zoning board, and certainly not familiar with your um, procedures here. But what we are familiar with is McClun Street, and just how different it truly is. What I would like, truly, before you vote and decide on this project as is, is that you all go to McClun Street and physically take a look at it and see the narrowing of it and see the different traffic coming at it right now when there's nothing there. To see the Davis Street <coughs> zipping through, the cement trucks, the, the city buses, the school traffic, I would really, really appreciate it if you would take a look at it in person as opposed to the way that it looks on the sketch just to get a true idea of what our concerns are so you can understand that we're not here just because boo-hoo Front Street gets it again. No, we're truly concerned about it. I know we've asked for a traffic study and I do understand that the last one was done around 2009. I have lived on the 1000 block of Washington and Front Street for over 15 years. And I can truly tell you that in the last three or four years, traffic has changed significantly, especially on McClun. So I don't know that I, if I am stepping out of bands, bounds, I hope I'm not. But what we'd really like to do is see you move the item uh, 7G and H from the consent agenda to the regular agenda tonight to give, us, give you all a chance to go to McClun Street and see what we're talking about. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> again, we appreciate people's viewpoints. We may not agree with them all, but it certainly is your right to come up here and, and say them. Um, this time, we I don't believe we have any recognition or appointments. Uh, so we'll pass through uh, item number six and move to the consent agenda that was just mentioned. The consent agenda contains items that the staff, at least, considers uh, not necessarily uh, need, uh, that discussion and a separate vote is necessarily needed. Um, we understand that sometimes people disagree with that. And uh, any single council member can pull an item off for a discussion if they wish. It does not take a vote um, of the council. And very often people go to their alderman and ask that that be done. Um, if an item is pulled, it will become part of the beginning of the regular agenda and will be separately discussed and voted upon by this council. So at this time, I'm going to ask uh, members of the city council, is there anything you'd like to see pulled uh, from the uh, current consent agenda? Okay, I see... Uh, no indications of pulling an item. Uh, that being the case, is there a motion on the consent agenda? Rob? Yes, I move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Okay, is there a second? Jim? Second. Okay, moved and seconded that we approve the consent agenda for this evening. Will the clerk please take a roll call vote on this, a yes vote is to approve the consent agenda. Alderman Fazzini. Yes. Alderman Fruin. I do not have any financial or business interest in any of the items listed in the consent, ag uh, consent agenda, and I vote yes. Alderman Sage. Yes. Alderman miller -Lamway. Yes. Alderman Stearns. I was hoping to comment on the consent agenda. Can't be done at this point. No, not. I vote sorry, yes. Judy, not under our I vote yes. Okay. Alderman McDay. Yes. Alderman Schmidt. Yes. Alderman Purcell. 
Yes. Okay, the consent agenda uh, passes. That now brings us to the uh, regular agenda for this evening. <coughs> the first item is the appointment of the uh, Ward 1 Alderman. Um, no, that's okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I meant, I meant to bring that in. Um, we we had three applicants, uh, former uh, alderman uh, Gibson, Alan Gibson, uh, was up here and uh, had a nice visit with Alan and uh, we reminisced about uh, some things and how things have changed also. Um, I also uh, met with uh, Kevin Lauer. Um, we had a, a discussion about aviation and <laughs> and that type of thing. We also talked quite a bit about uh, some of his feelings, and um, I talked to some of his recommendations, and it became clear to me that he was very passionate about some of the things that he felt. And then I talked to my eventual uh, nominee, uh, Jamie Matthey, and based upon um, items such as <clears throat> his knowledge of city issues, his involvement in some of the things in the city, his promise of commitment of, of time, um, and openness to talk to the citizens. Uh, it is my belief that uh, he is the uh, best uh, person to fill that position, even if it is for only a little bit over two months. Uh, the law requires that I make an appointment. Um, that is based upon my best judgment. I realize uh, from some of the speakers today that there may be some people that strongly disagree with my judgment in that matter. However, I still have to, it's my duty to make that, that appointment. And I have done so, but at the same time, the city council has the ability, uh, it has to uh, confirm that appointment. Um, so I hereby um, officially uh, nominate uh, Jamie Matthey uh, to fill the unexpired term of uh, Bernie Anderson for Ward 1. Um, and uh, I ask that the council go along with that uh, in confirming uh, that appointment. Rob. Uh, Mayor, I make a motion that we confirm your appointment of Jamie Matthey to the Ward 1 Alderman position until the next election. <coughs> okay, is there a second? Karen. I will second that. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to um, confirm that. Uh, with that, I would like to invite Mr. Matthew up and uh, give the council the opportunity to, um, f first to give you an opportunity to say a few things, but then I want to give the council an opportunity to uh, ask questions. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Council. Uh, my name is Jamie Matthew. Um, I've lived at 611 East Washington Street for the last 10 years. It's in the northern part of Dimmitz Grove. Uh, my wife, Kelly, and I have been residents there and um, active with our neighbors in the Dimmons Grove area. Um, we own Kelly's Bakery and Cafe in downtown Bloomington. Uh, I also founded, uh, one of the co-founders of Mavidia Technology Group. It's a computer company as well. Uh, between the two companies, we have about 35 employees. Um, I've been very active in the community, uh, in the Downtown Bloomington Association. Um, the Sunrise Rotary Group, and just various other community organizations. Um, Kelly and I have always had a strong policy of not saying no when people have asked us to volunteer. Um, I'm interested in the position, and I'm running as the writing candidate for Ward 1. Originally, I was going to support Bernie. Um, I felt like Bernie was doing a good job, and I appreciated that, and, and we had actually offered um, to help Bernie in whatever way he needed to. When Bernie was unable to continue, uh, I decided that I was going to step in and run as the writing candidate. 
uh, things that I'm passionate about. You know, living in an older neighborhood, I'm very passionate about um, the architecture, the integrity of the older neighborhoods, our infrastructure that holds them all together. Um, as a business owner, I uh, want to make sure that the city continues to be involved in economic development. I think that the city's got a very important role to play in economic development. And also um, continued safety. Um, you know, we, we very much appreciate the Bloomington PD. We've, um, we've had a couple of incidents in our neighborhood and at our house and um, the support and the response, excuse me, the response was amazing. Um, thank you very much for your consideration. I'm, I'm honored that you put me forward. Okay, um, Jamie, we're going to allow the council to ask questions and I'd like to start out. Um, in the last 24, 48 hours, uh, there was a question raised about something that happened, I think, in 1995. And you and I have discussed that. And I have to tell you that um, um, it, that did not deter me from my uh, appointment of you. But I think we better bring that out in the open and allow you to um, tell the people what, what you told me and, and what actually occurred uh, back Absolutely. then. Uh, when I was a college student and attending Heartland, uh, we had an apartment in um, East Normal, uh, and we did something stupid. We, uh, we had this idea that we were going to watch Monday Night Football, and I had a big TV, and the guys across the hall had cable, and so they strung the cable across the hall and connected my TV to it, and we watched Monday Night Football that night. Um, the landlord happened to come into the building that night, and they saw the cable, and he turned us in. Uh, and we all got um, misdemeanor fines from the Bloomington or from the normal police department for theft of service. Um, I did not know the implications of what we had done at the time. I realized that we had screwed up, um, so I just accepted the fine and I paid the fee and moved on about it. And I'd kind of forgotten about it. It was you know it was 1995. I was 22 years old. Um, since then, you know, I think that uh, a, a lot has changed in life. You know. Uh, met a good woman, fell head over heels, married her, started some businesses, did a lot of volunteer hours, but there's, you know, I don't have anything to hide. It was stupid, youthful indiscretion, and it's out there, and, you know, it is what it is, I think. Okay. Um, other questions? Rob? If Bernie Anderson had decided not to run, would you still be, per, would you have pursued a write-in candidacy? Would you have actually done a petition or would you have stayed out entirely? Uh, I would have run. It, I actually, there was, um, there were rumors that Bernie was considering running for mayor. And I actually called Bernie and I said, if you're running for mayor, I'm going to run for Ward 1. He said, no, those are just rumors. And I said, okay, then if you're going to continue to uh, represent Ward 1, I will support you. Dave. Mr. Matthew, what concerns me a little bit is is just kind of the way that this has popped up right in the 11th hour. And um, so as I've thought about that some today, I guess I understand and I, I want to acknowledge that um, I think we all did things in our late teens and, and maybe early 20s that were not good decisions. They, were, they weren't good things to do. I guess my concern is is that um, I guess I just need to to be certain that there's nothing else. Is there anything else out there that's was a something that happened even if if it was when you were 22 years old? Uh, um, no, there's nothing else that's happened like that ever. No, that's that's the only thing that I know of. Some speeding tickets. Yeah, and. I would acknowledge speeding tickets for myself as well. Uh, is it correct? Do I understand? Because um, I've been somewhat out of the, the flow here the last few weeks. Um, has has um, former Alderman Anderson has has he endorsed your um, candidacy? Endorsed my, he's endorsed my write-in candidacy. He has not endorsed the mayor's. Um, appointment because he did not feel that was appropriate. He specifically told the mayor, told me, and has told the media that 
that he has nothing to say about that whatsoever. But he has endorsed my writing candidacy. Okay. So there's nothing else out there, right? No. Okay. Thank you. I will just add to that that we did have a uh, local police background check done, and it did show the 1995 uh, situation, and it did show some speeding tickets. <clears throat> uh, the report I got back is that there was nothing else. Now, that is not an exhaustive multi-week background check where they start calling all your neighbors and um, and that type of thing. So if something happened 30 years ago in a distant community and so on, I acknowledge that we may not have found that, but, but locally uh, that's all we could find also um, in terms of the any, any type of criminal or misdemeanor background check. Well, I hope it didn't happen 30 years ago because I'd have been in fourth grade, so. Well, I remember doing some things in fourth grade, too, so. Yeah, no, I'm going out of office. No background checks, please. Jim. Uh, Mayor, I think this question is more to you than it is to Jamie. Well, it isn't to you. It is to you. And my thought in, in this whole process, and I want to be respectful of those that are very uh, loyal to their wards, um, but as Alderman Anderson made his decision in late January, whatever date that was, I would have assumed that we would have left that seat vacant and not made an appointment. My thought was that Ward 1 can be can be represented by the rest of the council. And a couple things fed into that in the sense that we really don't have a policy among ourselves with respect to what happens when a member is absent and something is on the agenda that involves their ward. We don't have any procedure that indicates we're going to lay this over. So I think maybe discussion for another day is maybe we need to tie this down a little bit. And um, this is not a speech about ward or community at large, but you know there's eight of us up here plus a mayor. And we ought to be able to speak for anybody that's absent for whatever reason and not uh, not be delayed by somebody's absence. Um, so I thought of that. And I thought over the years, we've had a number of aldermen that have resigned for different reasons, whether it's a moving situation, a health situation, or whatever. And we've had a variety of periods in which those vacancies have been filled. This one has been filled very quickly. So in some respects, I give you credit for that. But just a word or two from you as to what your thought was. Why is it necessary? Why is it recommended? Why is it appropriate to fill the spot for basically March and April as opposed to leave it vacant? OK, and, and <clears throat> I have to admit that that was one of the things that media immediately occurred to me. You know, can we just avoid any uh, contention and so on and not do that? And the simple answer is state law. Uh, I'm required, I believe, Todd, under state law to make this appointment. So, yeah, go ahead, Jim. I just want to make sure I understand that. The state law is what? That it be that an appointment be made within X number of days of a resignation, or tell me what that means. Uh, 60 days, I believe. Okay, so, so you had no choice. I, I had no but choice. But to make an appointment. Right, now I had a choice in, in whom was appointed. Okay. But I had no choice in the, I had to make an appointment under okay. the That law. helps, thank you very much. Okay. Other? Stephen. Oh, I'm next? Okay. No, you, you were first. Hi, Jamie. How you doing? Um, I have nothing personal against Jamie or, or anything, you know, you've done in the past or anything. I'm not worried about your speeding tickets. I've got you beat on that. So um, if they went by speeding tickets, I probably would have never gotten to council. Um, <laughs> nothing else. Um, but 
I really kind of feel, you know, it's very similar to the state's attorney uh, race where uh, they weren't going to put Foster or, or, or Jason uh, Chambers in there. They would put Dozier in there to cover that space until the two people ran it off. It would have been ideal, obviously, if you'd been running for the office and, um, and Mr. Lauer's running for the office too and, and Bernie resigned and we could, you know, make that decision at that point maybe to put Gibson or somebody else in there for the full two months. So I'll be voting no tonight because I think on the principle, I think um, you run as a writing candidate, that's great, but I think there is an advantage of being in there for two months and in four meetings. So I'm going to vote no on that. Uh, it may pass tonight. Uh, that's fine or whatever, but you know, I'll, I'll go with whatever the rest of the council says, but I just think in all fairness, I really think that uh, it should be somebody that's not running for the race appointed two months before the race. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure that was a question, but is there anything you want? is there an answer to that that you want to make? Or? I respect your opinion. So, um, yeah, Mboka. Sure. And I guess my question is for you, Mayor. Could you tell us a little bit about each of the the three candidates? And what led you to nominate Jamie over the others? Sure, um, I can summarize that a little. Again, I didn't do a formal rating system, and I can't give you, you know, somebody had 87% and somebody had 83 or something. But as I said, it was based upon uh, discussion. I think I spent at least an hour with each, with each of the candidates. Um, I followed up on uh, some references that were given. I went out and looked at uh, uh, social media uh, sites um, on the people. Um, uh, I looked back at um, past activity um, of the candidates. Um, I mean, those, those are some of the main things I recall uh, thinking about. Obviously, we did the uh, the uh, level one background check. So uh, th those are the types of things. And, and as I said, it's, it's very difficult because each candidate, I can't say that, um, we, I, I have to say that Alan probably could have done the job because he's done it before. Uh, I have to say that Kevin Lauer, I found him very passionate, very dedicated to uh, some of his ideas. Um, <clears throat> Jamie I had uh, worked with in the past. Uh, Kevin I really didn't know, and he did speak here what, about a month or five weeks ago, something like that. Uh, that was really the first time I had talked to him uh, with uh, Jamie, we had worked on some things before, but we weren't really that well acquainted. And to address some of the concerns earlier, um, that there's a conspiracy going on and so on, I have to say, and, and Jamie, I'd ask you the same question, um, <clears throat> other than going back months or so when we maybe met on some downtown issue or met, at, you know, said hi to each other at a, um event someplace, uh, I will state, and I'm going to ask you to state too, that we had no conversation either in person or with the telephone or via email um, uh, from the time that I heard through the grapevine that you were going to run and the time I actually sat you down in my office for an interview. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. So, again, I want people to know that there wasn't some type of a secret behind the the scenes uh, deal uh, going on here. I tried to approach this with a very open mind, and my honest opinion is that um, in the way I look at things, Jamie was the best applicant. So again, I think I'm getting asked more questions here than than uh, the uh, the nominee. So I'd ask, are there any other questions? Trying to ask a question. Okay. 
just a couple things. Um, did I did I just understand you to say that a background check was done, so this matter from several years ago would have already come up? Did I understand? so you knew about the theft? It, it came up after the, the results actually came up after the appointment because we did not do a background check on oh, all three of the individuals. You did not. No. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate your candor about it, um, and you certainly have every right in the world to explain it, and I'm glad that you're getting that opportunity because that's that's definitely the right thing, due process, and you every right in the world. Um, one question is expungement. Um, this, I believe, a Class A misdemeanor, isn't that right? Could be expunged. Um, apparently, you didn't have it taken off your record, and I'm just curious. Wouldn't that be the logical thing to do for a first offense, unless there was some other reason why it couldn't be expunged? There's no reason. I probably could have done it. Um, like I said, I just paid it and moved on. It's, I could have gone back and, and tried that, but, you know, I was wrong. I did it. I paid my fine to, you know, and I just moved on. I didn't really ever think anything else of it, so. And it never came up or affected, I mean, affected you so you you just didn't think it was important to have it expunged no it's never come up and you know i mean of uh you know background checks for any of the jobs that i've ever held it's never been an issue so i just i don't know kind of almost didn't remember it was there and just moved on with my life you sort of forgot about it yeah yeah um and like i said thank you for that um my my honest concern too is about the process of, of appointing people to the council and the fact that we have two candidates. We have two candidates here. We have Jamie, who's running a write-in candidacy, and we have Kevin, who's a declared candidate who's you know gone through the whole process of the, the petition and got on the ballot and all that. Um, and then we have Alan Gibson. I, I'm really confused that last time we had an, an appointment, council had the opportunity to interview them to see their resumes, to meet with them. And this time, um, council had no opportunity. Really, I mean, I appreciate your email over the weekend, but the weekends are kind of taken up. Um, so I'm, you know, the advice and consent, I'm really missing here. But also the fact that, taking Stephen's point, just as when there was a state's attorney opening, a candidate was appointed who is who was not a candidate, you know, a, a fill-in, an appointee, Judge Dozier, was appointed to be the state's attorney. And um, he was not running, so it didn't give anyone any advantage. And I think this, it's very, very important. The city, the council is nonpartisan. I don't think we should behave in a partisan way or give anyone an advantage in any way in an election. Now, you say Alan Gibson could have done it, you think, or you suppose. Um, and you didn't make that statement about Kevin Lauer. I'm sh quite sure, in my own opinion, knowing Kevin, that Kevin could certainly do it. Um, that's my opinion, and I'm sure Jamie could. Um, Alan Gibson did do it. He did it for four years, and there isn't, in my mind, any question that Alan could have been brought back in as a candidate who's not running, as a fair way to be fair to all parties concerned, and I'm very just disappointed that we're giving in my opinion, a very large advantage to one candidate. And in closing, I will say one other thing. Um, I'm sure that you didn't you know, discuss it or whatever, but of course we have had some pretty, very articulate and long emails from you, Jamie. Correct me if I'm wrong regarding the downtown and, and the FAR study, which I believe you thoroughly support. And you know, if you want to comment on that, feel free feel free to do that. But I think, I mean, you certainly are very well known to me from your emails mm -hmm. and also from coming down on downtown issues. You own two businesses downtown and such. So I certainly think that we know you, you know, from that standpoint. In fact, I think you were even president of the downtown Bloomington. Were you president at one point? Two years. Two years, yeah. So anyway, I think, Jamie, I think you're well known to us. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's all well and good. Um, but to say that, you know, we think of all the candidates equally, I... No, I'm, I'm not sure about that. So anyway, that's my opinion, and I do appreciate your stepping up, and I appreciate your candor and your honesty, and thank you. Anything else? Jamie, is there anything you want to say in closing? Uh, you know, if I could real quick, um, 
Judy um, Alderman Stearns. I was um, president of the DBA for two years. Uh, and you're right, I did um, support economic development in the downtown area. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we're clear. There was uh, there's two different FAR plans. There was the, the Main Street Corridor plan, which uh, raised um, a lot of conversation, I think would be the easy way to say that, um, regarding form-based code. And then as a separate plan, um, a separate time period, there were this, the downtown Bloomington master strategy. And that was the one that I did support. There were pieces of that that were controversial as well. Um, and it was not adopted by the council, but there are also people, pieces of that that are very well developed and, and fabulous information. Um, so I just want to make sure we're clear that there was two different reports. They just happened to be done by the same guy. Okay. <clears throat> Um, go ahead and have a seat, and I think it's time to uh, um, to vote on the motion. The motion is to confirm the appointment of Jamie Mathy as the replacement uh, alderman for Bernie Anderson um, in Ward 1. Uh, a yes vote will support that motion, and we're going to do this by uh, roll call vote. Alderman Cezini. Yes. Alderman Fruin. Yes. Alderman Sage. Yes. Alderman Miller Alamwe. Yes. Alderman Stearns. No. Alderman McDade. Yes. Alderman Schmidt. Yes. Alderman Purcell. No. Mayor Hutchinson. Mayor Stockton. Yes. Okay, the vote is seven to two in favor. This time, I would ask um, um, soon to be Alderman uh, Matthew to uh, come up and take the oath of office, and then we'll seat you in Bernie's former spot. Madam Clerk, will you please uh, swear in the new Alderman? And Mayor, if we, you know, we could ask uh, Mrs. Matthew to come up if she wants to stand next to her husband as he gets sworn in. Yeah, sure. Does anyone have a camera that we always allow? All right, come on, come on around back. You'll get a better. Raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I, Jameson, Jamie Matthew. I, Jameson, Jamie Matthew. Having been appointed. Having been appointed. To the position. To the position. Of Alderman for Ward One. Of Alderman for Ward One. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And I will faithfully discharge. And I will faithfully discharge. The duties of Alderman. The duties of Alderman. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. Congratulations. Thank you. Jamie, congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you have a different seat now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, welcome to the council and. Uh, I don't, did you have a chance, uh, did, did we get you a packet or? Uh, I downloaded it. Okay, yeah, it, I guess it would have been presumptuous to have given you a packet, but I'm glad you took that approach because you are entitled to uh, vote at this point. We now move to item number 8B. Uh, this is a, um, 
I was contacted and uh, asked to place on the we were asked to place on the agenda um, discussion of a motion to remove managed competition policy from the table. I think um, in January uh, we uh, we uh, voted uh, because of some questions on the language to um, to table that at least temporarily. Uh, since that time, we've received some comments from aldermen about how that could be improved. A second version was issued. Uh, I think we've already received at least two comments um, on that version. And uh, um, we will not be voting tonight on, on that. Uh, I don't think that under the way it was structured in the agenda that uh, we can vote. On that, so <clears throat> the purpose is not to discuss the language of that, um, or whether or not it should be ultimately passed. The purpose tonight is just to pull it off the table so that we can continue to refine and eventually vote on it, one way or the other. So with that, uh, Mr. City Manager, would you like to comment a little bit on the status? Of that just very quickly because again I don't want to get into uh, the, the details of it yes thank you mayor and I, I think it might also uh, bear uh, for us to just mention too that back on January 14th the uh, council was missing two aldermen um, due to illness medical conditions so we were dealing with seven instead of the nine aldermen and and so like you say that that request was to at least come back as uh, as the uh, corporate council did mention uh, the motion to table indefinitely the managed competition policy was was certainly unique for this council typically what uh, is usually transpired but again it's uh, not that it's out of the ordinary but um, the council can also table an item to a date specific uh, as the council knows certainly this particular policy is and uh, the um, is a significant issue that is tied up or involved in many of our labor negotiations right now both on the city's side of the labor bargaining team as well as on the union side so there is some uh, desire to ultimately at some point in time uh, determine if the this particular policy this philosophy is something that should continue to be part of those collective bargaining discussions and negotiations or uh, is the council especially when we're back to full staffing by the alderman something that you want to change course on uh, but as indicated uh, before the council can even take any action on this first they have to take it off the table and that's uh, the only reason uh, this has, is worded because if the majority passes this motion then the council uh, could also consider a motion to uh, put this on a future council agenda for action and that date would need to be specified by the council uh, so uh, that's where we are i'd be happy to answer any other questions uh, the council might have on on this particular motion which has been requested by members of the council okay at this time though i think it's probably appropriate um, I was told that someone wanted to make a motion uh, to remove it from the table. That would be appropriate at this time. Rob? I do move that we take consideration of the managed competition policy from the table. And I'll save my comments for why af after we have discussion. But that's the motion. Is there a second? Stephen? A second. Okay. Um, we need to take a, a vote on that. Well, we can discuss it at this point, and then we'll, we'll need to take a vote. My question is, uh, should, are we going to need to do that by roll call or? Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're open for a discussion. Um, thank you. Um, 
uh, David, could you just take a minute for everyone's benefit to talk about what it means to table this? Because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. When we talk about tabling something, a lot of times we're talking about just not doing it. But in this case, we're talking about the opposite. And I th I'd, like to I'd like to make sure that everybody who's here has the same understanding that we have on this. And what I'd like to do is turn to our parliamentarian, the corporate counsel, and ask him to uh, respond to that question. Todd Greenberg. Uh, and, and I understand why people are confused, because uh, sometimes I'm at the city's bargaining table during collective bargaining uh, negotiations. And uh, almost always, when, when we are in union negotiations, when one side or the other says, we're taking something off the table, that means we are withdrawing our proposal on whatever issue is being taken off the table. Uh, so that means, okay, we're, we're not going to press this issue during this round of negotiations anymore. It's, we're done talking with it. We're withdrawing the proposal. Unfortunately, when we're talking about parliamentary procedure, we're talking about the exact opposite when we say that we're taking something off the table. Uh, you know, because prior to that means that there's been a motion to table something. And that means uh, to defer consideration. And in fact, if you look at the rules that we passed uh, not too long ago, nine months or a year ago, uh, instead of saying that something is tabled, we actually use the phrase, it's a motion to defer consideration. And that's the effect of what the council did last month. It deferred consideration to an indefinite time of whether to adopt a policy on managed competition or not. Now, also under the rules that we adopted a while back, it states that if 100 days uh, come and go and the motion isn't revised, then that substantive issue uh, goes away. Uh, now, obviously, it could be brought back up by a future city council, something like that, but that's the effect of the rules. Now. Uh, so we're, I used the same phrase or suggested the same phrase tonight, uh, say we take it off the table, which means, in other words, that we're reviving if the motion passes. The council is revising, reviving uh, consideration of the managed competition policy. Uh, that doesn't mean it's, it's passing. It just means that the council is going to revive consideration of that and uh, rather than right now, where it's uh, deferred indefinitely from consideration, that makes it ripe again for the council to set a time to actively consider whether or not to adopt a managed competition policy. I've, um, I've thought of it as basically a delay, and my feeling about the reason that was done back in January was because there was the council is still trying to wordsmith this, and we needed we needed some more time. Um, and that brings up the question I, I would ask you, uh, David: When can we expect um, the, a version, the final final version of this? Or I guess nothing's final until we actually vote it through. But including the last comments we've had, will we have that by the end of the week? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. In my mind, even the, the version um, my assistant sent out January 30th was um, had minor changes. Uh, we incorporated what we heard. We even made some additional changes. So we're really talking about you know minor changes to the draft policy. Uh, and we could certainly, with the two extra comments we received, I think a few days ago, we could get out another draft by the end of the week. Judy. I, I think we, we need to clarify what this discussion is about. I have a lot of things that I'd be more than happy to say about managed competition, about taking it off the table. And I think one of them is it would seem that we're taking it, we're not only taking it off the table if we vote to do that, but we're, we know that the next vote is going to be on putting it back on the table. So my question is, I mean, the next motion, we're not just going to take it off, are we, and just let it sit? We, we would take it off the indefinite table, which after 100 days would die. Um, and then there'd be an opportunity to 
uh, schedule it for a definite date of consideration. So it goes from indefinite to a definite time where it could be voted on and either turned up or down. <laughs> well, that doesn't Voted doesn't answer down. doesn't answer my question. Okay. So, it, when are we getting ready to? Somebody's made a motion that we take it off the table, and somebody has seconded that motion. So we're going to decide: should we take it off the table? But and, and can that just be the end of it, or are we also going to subsequently name a date certain tonight? I, I think we I think we have to. Okay, well, well that's a technical uh, question. Let, let, let's, let's have our parliamentarian answer that rather than a member of the council. Well, um, a motion to revive consideration is a prerequisite under the, under the council's rules uh, to substantive consideration of the issue. And I'm quoting right now from the council city code, uh, motion to defer consideration, and then parens, to table, unparens, says the council may defer a substantive motion for later consideration at an unspecified time. A substantive motion, the consideration of which has been deferred, expires 100 days thereafter unless a motion to revive consideration is adopted. If consideration of a motion has been deferred, a new motion with the same effect cannot be introduced while the deferred motion remains pending. A council member who wishes to revisit the matter during that time must take action to revive consideration of the original motion or else move to suspend the rules. So unless the city council wants to suspend the rules and immediately proceed to consideration of managed competition, which I don't think it can do tonight because of the Open Meetings Act. Uh, then the other situation and the cleaner situation is to revive consideration of the substantive motion, which is whether or not to adopt a managed composition policy. Now, if the matter gets revived, uh, and that remains to be seen as whether the council votes to do that, then it is in order for the council to schedule this for a specified time for their consideration. Now, because of the Open Meetings Act and the fact that we didn't have 48 hours advance notice of the fact that the City Council was going to consider whether or not to adopt a managed pol comp uh, competition policy, we can't do it at tonight's meeting. The earliest it could be done would be at the last meeting in February or at a subsequent time if that pleases the Council. All that you're doing with the motion right now is to vote to take the consideration from an unspecified time, and then it's in order thereafter to decide what you know what specified time to consider it. Okay, so right now we're just limited to whether or not to bring it in off the table. Correct. And um, if we do, as I said earlier, as chair, uh, I agree with you. I don't think it'd be proper to consider the any substantive thing tonight because it hasn't been listed on the agenda. Correct. Jennifer. Uh, okay. Excuse me. I have a question. Um, and I'm going to ask it. I've been trying to decide if it needs to be asked now or, or during what I think is going to be a subsequent motion because I do think there will be one. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it now. Apologies in advance if it's the wrong time. Um, but, you know, I've had a question all along about <clears throat> timing on this. And um, I know we're not discussing the policy itself tonight, but since this conversation is all about when we do discuss it, it seems that it's appropriate to ask the question of timing now. Uh, so my question is, and I think I asked the same question the last time we discussed this, is... <clears throat> you know, and I guess this is for David, if you can help me understand the time frame in which, in which this is coming in front of the council. Um, because, you know, it's, it's, <coughs> it's clear to me that, um, you know, we have, we have a lot of changes on the council. There's possibility for a lot of future changes on the council. And, so I'm, I'm still having a lot of trouble understanding the timing on this, and I'm still having 
trouble, I guess, understanding the urgency, at least as it appears to be <clears throat> the case tonight. So if you could just address the, the issue as you see it in terms of, you know, the time frame. Thanks. I'd be happy to. Um, as the council knows, uh, the managed competition as a philosophy, as a practice, um, as a technique to achieve cost efficient and effective services has been discussed, you know, for about, oh, probably good three years. And one of the things that the council has given ourselves, myself and the city's bargaining team, is to place managed competition as a priority as in our labor negotiations. And when I say a priority, and that is, um, it's a priority to one, if there's been labor contracts that prohibited the city from ever considering outsourcing positions to remove that. Um, furthermore, if um, union contracts made no mention as to whether or not outsourcing, privatization, managed competition is either permitted or pro, uh, permitted or prohibited, it's been your priority that our labor negotiating teams seek to put in these uh, union agreements permissive language so that uh, even, even though it's permissive language, it would be something that down the road as we go through the process of managed competition, which includes a significant outreach, collaboration, coordination, if you would, with the unions as we look at the cost of providing the service either by private companies or public employees, there is a great deal of time that will be spent looking at that. However, uh, what we've been negotiating at your direction and priority is to at least in each of these contracts, and keep in mind we have 10 of them in the city, permissive language so that at some point in time, uh, if there is a dispute, unfair labor practice or any other charge complaint that could be raised, the labor agreements always give the city uh, that right to consider and to possibly act on uh, outsourcing if it chose to do so. Now, of course, that decision would be the city council's. Um, so um, at this point in time, uh, our labor negotiations are continuing with a number of uh, union uh, groups, uh, many of which are here tonight. And this is something that our negotiating team is seeking some confirmation. Is that still a priority of the city council? Is that something our negotiating team should continue to seek as a priority to try and get in uh, all the labor agreements were in the midst of negotiating. Uh, if it is not, then that's something, you know, we can always change course. But I think uh, that's one of the dilemmas we face right now is trying to once again just see if this council, as it has supported in the past, that priority of at least getting permissive language in the contracts, uh, do you still uh, feel that way? Is that still the direction? And unfortunately, I think the union representatives from the January 14th meeting have maybe taken away different perceptions of what the council was saying uh, by that discussion and by the tabling indefinitely of the managed competition policy. Um, so I hope that that kind of helps from a time frame of you know, the impact that's having on myself and our, our labor negotiating team, which is at the table on a number of contracts. Okay, um, I see no other. Okay. Uh, Judy, you, had, you push the button first. Okay. Thank you. Um, my, that's, that's really troubling, and in fact, I think it's outside the scope of what we should be discussing tonight. I think that is getting into the issue itself and not of taking it off the table, and that's, I don't think it's appropriate. I don't think this, you know, that we can get into labor negotiating contract issues here. I don't think it's, that's what it's about. 
But I will say that we had, and I think this is fair enough in talking about taking it off the table, we had a very long and, in my opinion, very substantial discussion about this. Was it, was it two council meetings ago, I guess? And people who supported this policy, if you will, had every opportunity to voice their support and to vote for it. Now, I'm going to try to stay away from discussions about the, stu the substance because I've been told that's not what this is about. But I'm going to go ahead and say my position has not changed and my, my opposition before my, I, I flat opposed and then other people tabled had nothing to do with the language. It had to do with a lot of other things that, again, I've already been told I can't discuss. But I'm going to consider that voting to detable it, as far as I'm concerned, or untable or whatever the phraseology is, is basically support for this. And my position has not changed, nor has the discussion that we had last time changed. I'm not sure that a policy in any way is even, is even necessary. You know, and, and, and I have a lot of things to say about managed competition, about outsourcing, because I have done a lot of, resource, of research on it, um, a lot of research. And I, at this point in time, am saying I'm not changing my position. Um, so that's, that's where I'm coming from. Um, and I think if, if people want to, you know, detable this, then I think that's a change. Um, and it's a quick change, and it's a change that I find, I find the timing very, very troubling, especially with a new, um, with a new council member. I just find this beyond coincidence, that we can't just let this simmer, think about it, research it ourselves, look at a lot of other cities, consider the process, and then also consider a new mayor, a new council, and a lot of other, a lot of other considerations. I think this is far too fast. Um, I, I don't like the way this. I don't like the way this feels, and I will not vote to take it off the table. Thank you. And I'll be brief um, with my comments. Um, I will be supportive of the motion when we when we vote on it here in a few minutes. Um, I, I would say it sounds like that possibly. Uh, there could be a second motion and that follows to, to you know, put this on, on a future agenda. I guess for myself personally, and just given the fact that I've, uh, again, been out of the flow here for a couple of weeks due to, due to some surgery, um, I guess I would, I me mean, personally, I don't know that I would be in favor of doing that tonight just so that I have more time to look at the revised policy and, and understand and, and, and acknowledge that all the, the changes have been incorporated in the feedback from, from the alderman. Um, so again, I will be supporting the first motion, and but would be uncomfortable if we have a, a second motion tonight for a date certain. I feel like I want to have more time to to review those updates. Thank you. Okay, uh, at this time we're going to go ahead and take a roll call vote um, to take the motion off the table. Uh, yes vote supports taking it off the table and. Madam Clerk, if you please uh, take that vote. Alderman Fazzini. Yes. Alderman Fruin. Yes. Alderman Matthew. That's tricky, Jamie. <laughs> uh, you're not you're not holding a button, are you? Right. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know why you're. Alderman Sage. Yes. Alderman Milwalamwe. Yes. Alderman Stearns. No. Nope. Alderman McDade. No. Alderman Schmidt. Yes. Alderman Purcell. Yes. Okay, motion carries. Is it seven to two or? Seven to two. Okay. Motion carries seven to two. I move to place the managed competition policy on the April 22, 2013 date city council agenda for action by the council, whether we want to do it or not.
April 22. April 22, 2013. Uh, that being after all the elections and giving us plenty of time, I second that motion. Okay. Uh, we have a motion on the floor to uh, revive this and uh, con next consider it on April 22nd after the elections. Jennifer. So perhaps it'll be more clear why I asked the question earlier about time frame. I think, you know, and, you know, I think you just have to call a spade a spade in that case. If, if this is to give an indication of what this council thinks, then the council that you see sitting here, that will be our last meeting on April 22nd. So it is an absolutely a timing issue. That's why I asked the question earlier. I didn't feel that there was a compelling response as to, I was looking for a time frame. I was looking for, for a period of time, days, weeks, months, and I, I just didn't get a compelling, a compelling, a compelling time frame. And so my concern is, and I'm, and, you know, taking the opportunity to express that here, is that if, again, I just feel that the policy, because it, you know, this, then the policy will basically be passed or, or not by a council who, whose makeup will change by at least a couple of individuals within just less than two weeks of that. And so to me, at that point, is it, um, you know, this is, this is such a complicated matter. It deserves, it deserves a lot of work. My gosh, we've, We've been on it for three and a half years. So what's another couple of weeks if it's really supposed to be an indication of, of the council that's up here? Um, I, I, I just, I can't support the April 22nd uh, date and I'll be voting no on this motion. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? Jim? I know the uh, motion's been made for April 22nd, but um, and I'm respect, respectful of Alderman Sage's interest for a little time, so why not, maybe we're splitting hairs here, but why not earlier in April, why not the first meeting in April? We, we, we continue to stretch this out, and so what we're going to be doing here from middle of May, early May to end of April, we're going another two months without any action. No, the motion is what it is. So 60 days, for 60 days, we're not going to do anything. Is that correct? Is that my assumption? That's the current motion. Okay. Mboka. Thank you. Um, I voted to remove this off the table because I'm always interested in what people have to say. Um, and um, as you know, earlier uh, in January, I voted against it because what I saw um, I didn't think would work very well. It was still very ambiguous. Um, so my, my vote to take it off the table is not necessarily indicating support, but I, I'd like to see it work on a little bit more. Um, and eventually, I, I mean, I may vote for it or may not. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to indicate that. And I, and I do... Um, at the same time, also um, feel the same pressure for 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 time. You know, I think this is a fairly serious issue, um, and I, you know, I, I tend to want to think about things um, a little longer uh, than most. Um, so, um, I I mean, I would be in favor of a little more time. It it, it doesn't matter to me. Um, if it's March, April, or wherever, but I, you know, I, I think two weeks, as was suggested earlier uh, on the next council uh, agenda, I think will be a little too quick, you know, to do a, a good thorough job, in my opinion. Okay. Well, the, mo the current motion on the table is the second meeting in April, which I guess is the twenty-second. So, um, uh, it's. Judy. There's, there's been absolutely no determination at all that a policy is necessary, it, what the, even the function of a policy is. 
we've we've been waiting three and a half years. I'm not sure. I'm I'm not sure that um, this council can bind another council. I I am sure that yes, it will change in it will change more than it already has by at least two more members and and maybe more. Um, they're going to be implementing something, I, I guess, uh, if if it can even be done by with a new council. It, the new council may have an entirely different. Um, philosophy. They, they may want to study the issue themselves. To me, after three and a half years, I, it's just, it's, it's beyond belief. It's just beyond belief. And I'm not going to get into the merits because I've been told I can't. But I, I see April 22nd as, as just crazy because it's right before a new council. Some new, new members are seated and I don't even know if we could bind them um, so I won't vote for the April 22nd either. And I'm not sure that, you know, I, I just think that there's much, much, much to be said about this. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, take the vote. I was explaining the, uh, the motion, a yes vote supports uh, reconsidering this in, um, on, on April 22nd, the second meeting in April. And we'll do a roll call vote. Alderman Fazzini. Yes. Alderman Fruin. Yes. Alderman Matthew. Yes. Alderman Sage. No. Alderman Olamwe. Yes. Alderman Stearns. No. Alderman McDade. No. Alderman Schmidt. No. Alderman Purcell. Yes. Motion carries five to four. So we will take this up again on April 22nd. Uh, David, continue to, to work with the council to try to um, get this specific so that we have something very specific to vote on. And the next time we talk about this, we will talk about the merits of it. So thank you. We now move to um, item 8C, which is the city manager's recommended budget for fiscal year 2014. And this is um, something that uh, we will not be uh, voting on. It's just a high-level presentation of uh, all the work that's been going on um, with staff uh, to prepare a budget. So, David? Mayor, if, uh, if you don't mind... Uh, can I just ask for a little five-minute recess? You know, okay. Come back and yeah, and again, uh, we're going to ask that people not disrupt the, the meeting, deliberately especially. It's up to the council if you want to take a quick uh, I, I can. Uh, All right. How, how long are we going to do this? I'm going to move through it as quickly as I can. But okay, let, let's let's try to hold this to no more than 15, 20 minutes. Can you do that? Um, yes, I can. <laughs> $169 million budget? Yeah, well, <laughs> I can okay. do it in five minutes. <laughs> hey, I, I'm hearing both things. No, uh, I'm, I'm going to let's take a quick bathroom recess right. here and so on. Uh, <laughs> please be back in five minutes.
I thought maybe you wanted a new frame too. Though. Yeah, I'm <laughs>
I'll give Judy a chance to get up here. Okay, I hereby call this meeting back to order after a brief recess. Um, David, we were in the middle of uh, starting mm -hmm. to talk about a high-level presentation of, of the budget, and apparently it's going to be a higher level than we thought. <laughs> That's right. We'll keep it high level. Uh, Mayor and Council, before I get into a, just a very brief budget message, I do want to uh, acknowledge a, a couple of milestones. Uh, first off, uh, you're receiving the city manager's recommended budget at least 30 days earlier this year than last. Um, <laughs> what this does is it, yeah, it gives the council, you know, at least two months, possibly two and a half months, to consider the recommended budget, to discuss it, uh, to consider it, and also to take significant citizen input. In fact, you know, as I'll um, I want to mention again, we've, uh, after tonight's presentation and as you begin to read the budget document, which is in two volumes, uh, we do have a citizen voice meeting scheduled for the end of February, Wednesday, uh, February 27th. And in utility bill inserts, we have encouraged um, the citizens to go out on the website beginning tomorrow. This budget will be out there. We we'll encourage them to go in. Uh, to go out and look at the recommended budget and then come to the citizen voice meeting in a sort of informal public hearing, really give to you, the council, uh, input on city needs, city concerns, uh, what about some of the city services, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, that's going to be our significant citizen engagement uh, opportunity this year to really have the citizens come and hopefully focus their comments at the citizen voice meeting on the city's financial plan for this upcoming year. Um, secondly, uh, I also want to acknowledge that we've got Patty Lynn Silva, our finance director. She's been assisted by Paulette, the chief accountant, Tim Irvin, the budget officer, and Chris Tomerlin as well as many other members of the finance team and all our directors and many, many employees in developing and assisting in pulling this budget document together. Uh, one thing that that's unique is this is the first time we've used the MUNA software system to actually put together uh, the budget recommendations and the report you're seeing in this. So uh, that in and of itself, again, is a significant uh, achievement to use the MUNA software system, you know, this year for the first time to assist us. And part of that is to assist us in being accurate in all our projections, being able to uh, quickly and comprehensively pull the numbers together. Uh, and over the last two months, as we've been constantly going through the budget and the department recommendations, it's been truly invaluable in helping us get to this particular time. Uh, with that being said, let me just, and uh, I've been facing a little sinus infection here, so if you bear with me a little bit. Um, Mayor and Council, tonight I'm presenting to you a proposed budget for all funds of $169.4 million. Uh, this is significant uh, because um, uh, of a couple of things. One. We do not have included in the general fund budget, which is a portion of that, any usage of general fund balance. If you turn to page 74 for a minute, and I think this is important to kind of throw out even right up front, you might recall that one of your priorities and my priorities has been to continue to increase the general fund's unreserved fund balance. If you look on page 74, at the end of fiscal year 2012, uh, our fund balance was 14.4 million. We're projecting a fund balance at the end of April 30th, 2013, of 17.1 million. And then at the end of this next fiscal year, only a slight, uh, <coughs> slight decrease of that, 17.2 million. <coughs> So once again, from a general fund standpoint, <coughs> excuse me, we are 
again, have made great inroads in trying to increase that fund balance, try to have it even more than our target. Uh, and it also is going to play a role because before I'm done, I just want to touch on some things that are not in the budget that are still in play. Keep in mind, any budget is certainly a very dynamic document and it's an ongoing dynamic process as we've tried to put together some of the revenue as, as well as some of the expenditure projections. Um, there is still some significant issues that we're grappling with and trying to deal with. Nevertheless, I think it's very important to, uh, to point out that we have existing resources and capability to de continue to deal with some very big ticket items, and I'll, I'll get into a few of those in a minute. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the, uh, that the City Council um, recognize the difficulties being experienced by our local residents and businesses during economic downturns. And in an effort to kind of offer some measure of relief, the City Council voted in December to lower the 2012 property tax levy, which is collected during the 2014 fiscal year. This uh, so-called $400,000 reduction means an $11 decrease in property taxes for a property owner who has a home uh, valued at $150,000. So even with uh, the tax levy reduction, the city, we've been able to bring to you a balanced budget and still keep our general fund balance uh, very intact, even with um, a little increase from last year. I do want to point out that we're very fortunate <clears throat> in as much as our local economy has continued to fare better as far as its recovery from the Great Recession than many other communities. Uh, furthermore, uh, we've had a very strong and successful local econo economic development program. When you just look at our efforts this past year with one full-time employee, uh, it's just phenomenal. Not only the businesses this individual has been able to assist, but even recently we've talked about bringing Wirtz Beverage uh, into town, uh, Ashley Furniture, and many other businesses which continue to provide more job opportunities for our, our citizens and hopefully down the road continuing to give us additional revenue to keep uh, a ongoing control on property tax and any possible escalation. Uh, with any budget, and especially as we get in into long-term uh, recommendations, I think it's also important that our another major goal is continuing to keep our credit rating. Uh, high and um, even just recently, Fitch ratings reaffirmed the city's AA plus rating and our outlook is being stable. We're just a notch below a AAA, but even with all the accolades this company gave to our administration, our council, and uh, the positive aspects of this local economy, they continued to talk about the state of Illinois. And unfortunately, the fiscal um, um, problems that our state of government is facing is a drag on our potential to even see our credit rating go up higher. And so all the cities, all the local governments in the state of Illinois are having uh, you know, continued uh, impact because of the, city, of the state's fiscal woes. Let me, if I can, just mention a couple of uh, highlights um, in the area of what we're trying to do in addressing public safety and infrastructure and uh, culinary water supply. First, in the area of public safety, uh, we have a number of positions that we're proposing to add. Uh, three of these are firefighters, but it basically, we're adding three firefighters so we can reduce uh, a very high overtime budget for the fire department. What we're finding is not only in the fire department, but in other departments, sometimes that overtime, uh, even though it helps us to kind of keep up and to deal with some of the demands when we have vacancies, but it also can add to the wear and tear and the impact of health on our employees. And these three firefighters will help us bring down the overtime, but also help us give 
all the overtime, all the firefighters a little bit of uh, um, risk, you know, uh, break from sometimes having to work so many hours. Uh, in the area of the police, there is two um, two police officers' positions being brought on in the interest of continuing to address our neighborhood needs, continuing to keep up uh, patrols throughout the city and to deal with all the myriad of services our police provide. And furthermore, uh, because we're also uh, continue to be down on actual uh, people working on a day-to-day -day basis, either because of illness, work, being out on workman's comp leave or other things, the adding a, two extra police officers, I believe, is a significant investment in continuing to make sure we can deal with the public safety uh, needs out there. Uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, as you know, <coughs> we, I, I recommend that we increase our street repair budget by a half million dollars to four million. This, coupled with the motor fuel tax of two million, gives us about six million dollars we're proposing to spend on road and street repairs, new road projects, and so forth. Furthermore, I re recommend a doubling of the budget for sidewalk repair and replacement. Uh, we're going up from 150 to 300,000. Uh, and we do have a sidewalk master plan that is uh, uh, currently out there. We're still going through that before bringing that to you. But we certainly have an ongoing and a great need, not only in street resurfacing, but in sidewalk repair. And this budget gives us a little, uh, an additional uh, resources to again make an impact in, in targeting money in those particular areas. I think one thing that's significant about this budget is we're continuing developing a 20-year capital improvement program. It is, it is unusual for a city of this size not to have such a document. Uh, and as you know, we have a, a number of master plans underway. You'll be seeing the sanitary sewer and stormwater master plan in a couple of months. Uh, we're also going to be working in this next year on a water as well as a transportation master plan. And these documents, when they're all put together, will not only give you and the, and the public a good, clear, and specific view and an understanding of not only what are the infrastructure needs, but also what are the priorities. One of the great challenges we're going to face when all these uh, are completed is how, then you, how do you take all those needs and begin to put together a financial plan that will address not only keeping the balance of what is done uh, and when it's done, but also what is the ability of our taxpayers and our community to afford in a real estate manner some of those uh, expenditures and investments needed uh, down the road. I also want to point out that <clears throat> we're continuing work on our water supply uh, plan. Uh, I've even provided additional resources to continue this effort. Uh, the, uh, the water supply plan uh, is uh, there's a lot of effort currently going on on analysis and investigation of specific properties, sites where one or more wells could eventually be drilled. Um, and uh, that work will continue. We have funding in here to continue at the appropriate time to look at land acquisition costs preparatory to any detailed uh, planning and design of other improvements. Uh, other infrastructure needs this year, for the first time, we've got three traffic signals uh, being provided, uh, as well as uh, some further land acquisition for the Hamilton Road project. In the budget message, you'll see some of the highlights of some of these major projects. We are definitely trying to continue to upfront and to spend money on design so that we can better get a handle of what is going to be the cost of some of these big ticket items. You might recall in the work session, we took the, talked about two major projects going over railroads. And that in and of itself can be extremely complicated and, lo and require long drawn out negotiations with the railroads. Furthermore, though, we recognize that these projects, we need to be aggressive in going after outside revenue to help fund those. 
And uh, you read recently of some of the efforts of our staff to look at some of the state grant projects. Uh, and also, there's uh, also going to be an effort to look at federal assistance going forward. But uh, you can not only take a look at some of these uh, particular uh, highlights, but the details in the second volume of this particular book. Um, I also have a recommendation in here to help fund uh, a new position, a communication manager. It is in order to, to address the Council's priority of citizen engagement and continuing a, a much more uh, aggressive program of working with citizens not only at the early stage of a capital project but all throughout um, and to help keep our, our, our community informed of just what the city is doing the progress we're making, how are we using their tax dollars and utilizing that in a cost-efficient cost and an effective manner. We have got to augment current city services and uh, part of this person's job will help not only to help keep our website very much robust, active, complete, but it'll also give us an opportunity to even be more transparent, put more information out there on the website. Uh, but that's a, a uh, position we've talked about in the past, but it's critical that we provide staff this additional resource because we just can't give it the merit it needs given our size of population and in order to have a very effective community outreach uh, program. Uh, let me just take a, a few minutes and mention a few things that are not in this budget at the present time. Uh, there is some very large ticketed items that we've been working on, discussing at great length, including the Eagle View Park. The six to $700,000 to complete the construction of that is currently not in the budget. However, we're continuing to evaluate some alternative sources of revenue to hopefully address that six to 700000 If that's not successful, um, we are still facing a... Um, OSLAD grant contract that expires December 31st. Uh, we have plans and specifications complete. We could actually put those out on the street uh, with uh, very little advance notice. Uh, so uh, we are working on trying to address not only the funding, but also trying to recognize we're also up against uh, an expiration date uh, that in my mind we don't want to risk l loss of this $400,000 grant. We're also in discussions and continuing to look at the need for a another aerial ladder truck. Uh, we feel and in talking with the fire chief that there's still a great need for that. I'll leave that for another time to talk about some of the issues surrounding uh, the purchase of that particular piece of equipment. Uh, as you know, one of the uh, master plans completed recently is the fire station renovation study. Uh, we have some very significant needs there. However, what I have done at the present time is I've held back trying to fund an individual piece of that until such time as we can coordinate a very comprehensive finance strategy for all those stations. Uh, many of these have to be done in sequence or in a separate manner, uh, but that particular capital project and some of these others may be tied up into uh, uh, more of a, uh, a, a, uh, a specific financing project down the road. Furthermore, the solid waste study. As you know, uh, we'll be bringing to you the final study uh, or the final um, version of that plan here within a couple of months. Uh, at that time, the council will be facing a number of significant policy decisions, and that is, should this service be funded ultimately uh, and be fully uh, funded by user fees, uh, whereas even right now in this budget, we've had to increase some of the general fund subsidy, but also should all, should all the services continue to be provided, or should some of the services be changed to a fee basis so that solid waste services is also something that will have to be dealt with at a later time. And finally, the 20-year capital improvement program. As we continue with these and get the plans completed, we have to look at 
going to the next step, and that is doing rate studies to see, based on operating and capital needs, what needs to happen by, uh, to the user fees in order to appropriately and adequately protect our investments, whether it be water treatment plants, uh, whether it be uh, beginning to replace some of our old antiquated uh, underground utilities. We'll also be looking at development impact fee studies and now how that can hopefully uh, perform a much significant role in the future of funding some of these facilities needed for new growth as opposed for those for existing growth. And then uh, lastly, uh, with our finance director's help, we'll be looking at how to pull everything together, all these capital needs, and how do we come up with a long-term financing strategy it's, uh, as you've heard previously, uh, about half of our total outstanding uh, indebtedness will be paid off in 10 years' time. On the other hand, some of these critical needs won't be able to wait for 10 years. But uh, over the next couple of years, we'll be facing some very critical decisions of once we're aware of the needs and the priorities is how do we start putting together uh, I think a very wise but prudent plan to make further investments in our infrastructure so that that can also drive economic development. It can help assure our residents that they can have a, a comfort level and know that they can rely on continuing to get clean water and rely on all the underground systems we have, whether it be sanitary, sewer, and that ultimately all the above ground facilities, whether it be roads, sidewalks, and so forth, are in proper condition and don't uh, pose a public safety hazard. Uh, that in just a, a highlight is some of the more significant aspects of this budget. Once again, there is still some significant issues, but uh, this year we wanted to try and not rely on any general fund balance help fund any of our operating capital. Furthermore, even though there's some capital lease uh, 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 purchases earmarked, we've tried to only reserve that for high ticket items, where in the past sometimes we were including some lower costs. So you're seeing a much more uh, paying cash for lower dollar amount vehicles and, and et cetera. Uh, so over the next month, uh, I will continue to come back and report to you our effort on some of these other items that I mentioned that are still not in this budget uh, that I think warrant your consideration uh, as we continue to get more details, more information, so that you can really make some appropriate decisions whether or not there should be any changes or additions uh, to this particular budget. Uh, once again, I just want to extend to all the directors, the employees, Patty Lynn Silva, our finance director, and her team for getting this, helping get this recommended budget document to you a month early. And this gives you up to two months or more for your consideration. Just want to remind everyone again that on Saturday, March 2nd, we're gearing up for a city council budget work session. And uh, between now and then, I look forward to uh, receiving any questions you have on the budget so that the staff and I can respond to anything uh, that comes up as you begin to go through this document and begin to uh, come up with uh, any, uh, any questions you might have uh, so that you can get a better understanding before you're ready to even consider any final adoption down the road. With that, Mayor, I'll turn the time back to you and the Council. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this time, again, this is meant to be a very high-level view, and I don't want to get into any um, substantive questions. Uh, we all need time to get through all these um, pages. Are there any questions about the timing or, or how we're moving forward on this? Okay. Uh, seeing... Oh, I'm sorry, Jennifer, I didn't see that. Sure, go ahead. And I apologize if you answered this earlier, but... The citizen voice meeting that's coming up where people can come and actually ask the questions about the budget. Um, is this document on the website where they can see it so that they can review it? And if if they wanted to see a, a 
paper copy of it? Maybe is there one available here at City Hall? It, it will be posted to the website tomorrow. There will be hard copies both at the library and the city clerk's office. Um, yeah, so it, and we're also, I think we've even left with you some CDs. So we're even trying to have some of those available as well. So, yeah. Boca. David, do you have a, a um, an idea of what the schedule will be like for uh, budget discussions on March 2nd? Because I do have some residents who are interested in attending, but they'd like to be there for at least a portion that's in that interests them. Uh, well, again, it, it's going to be the City Council's budget work session. We are bringing in uh, Lynn Montai to help facilitate that together with the mayor uh, to put some structure. And, and I think this time we kind of want to look to, to Lynn and the council as to, you know, how you would like to most effectively use your time that Saturday. So that's still kind of a work in progress as the mayor and I, you know, talk to Lynn. But we'd certainly appreciate your input, too, how you would like to... Um, you know, proceed. Jim? Help me clarify that question. That's a good question. The citizen voice meeting is focused on the budget. Mm -hmm. So that's really the best opportunity, right, for people to come and well, offer um, public input. Is that right or not? I, I think it can be focused on the budget. I, I don't think we have any requirement that that's all people can talk about. I, I thought that was the emphasis of it, but it, that would be our desire. Okay. But again, we're open to people bringing up other points. Have we figured out the structure of that citizen voice meeting with the thought that are they able to visit with department heads, city council members? Is this kind of a walk the room type thing, or is this a just as in the past, just a microphone and make your comments and okay. Right, and ask for explanations. Okay. You know, somebody comes in, looks at a hard copy here, and says, what in the world is that for, or we don't need that. Okay. That's their opportunity to, to express that publicly well before we ever vote on it. And Mayor, if I could, you know, keep in mind there will still be a very formal public hearing on the budget. Uh, however, that is typically... Uh, held on the last council meeting night, sometimes even just before final adoption. However, that sends the wrong message, I think, to the public. You know, you come and talk the night you're going to approve it. That's why the citizen voice meeting is being scheduled even before your workshop. So you can hopefully get, you know, as a lot more public input in an early stage before you even start some of your serious deliberations on changes, alterations to the budget. Um, I hope, though, at Citizen Voice that we're going to start this off with some kind of overview of the budget, and this is a lot to digest, even for those of us who are used to looking at this every year. I can't imagine somebody kind of walking in cold and being able to make some comments, so kind of helping everyone understand our priorities, where we're putting our money, what we're not able to do anything you can do like that and I know it's hard to do in 10 or 15 minutes but I think boy the, just a Q&A would be really tough well <clears throat> we'll work on on that but remember this is just the very beginning of, of our discussions we're going to have the work session a few days later and there'll be public hearings and and so on um, I, I'm just glad to see that we've got this budget that much sooner and we appreciate that okay um, there's no action on that we'll now move ahead David you also wanted to talk under discussion about the general uh, street resurfacing project I believe we have that map here somewhere thank you mayor uh, what we did want to give you is, is just indicate that since our last meeting and discussion of the preliminary resurfacing list for 2013, we really didn't receive anything substantial that would change the list. However, the list you have tonight is uh, calculated to arrive at $4 million approximately in street resurfacing 
uh, work. The previous list you had had a $4.5 million price tag. So what we did is we took those lower rated half million dollar projects off. Uh, these are the same 22 that would have been the higher priority street projects. It is our intent to continue to work on getting these prepared so they would be part of our March bid package to put out on the street to solicit bids and then bring back to you probably the uh, uh, second meeting in April, a contract award to uh, proceed with the resurfacing of these streets, uh, assuming they can all be afforded within the $4 million this summer. So uh, once again, we just wanted to bring this and, and just make sure that you have, we'll go ahead and replace what's out there on the website showing this $4 million list. Uh, keep in mind, staff is still working on developing some of the specifics specifications for each road and doing further investigation of underground uh, situations such as the the age of some of the uh, sewer lines and water lines so there still could be some changes because of that ongoing technical evaluation uh, making sure that uh, that none of these should be changed and it could be additional repairs might be needed in some of these streets which could still allow require some of these streets to drop off to stay within the four million dollar price tag so that's just an update to let you know we are proceeding uh, unless the council had any other directives so thank you okay thank you oh you have a um, could you talk just a little bit about Lutz Road? I know you and David Sage have talked about this, and there, we've gotten so many emails about it. I'd kind of like to get it out. Yeah, and, and, and let me ask uh, Jim Karch uh, if he'd come up. Uh, first off, we do have a five-year um, program of, of projects to be funded with motor fuel tax. Uh, Lutz Road is one of those out there, but so is Hamilton, but the Commerce. Fox Creek Road and the Union Pacific Bridge Crossing and some other. Uh, what, we're, what we're sometimes lacking, however, is some of these, say, rural roads, and I'll have Jim get into that, is we don't have a good objective methodology to say, you know, whether it be Lutz Road, whether it be Lafayette, Maple to Main Street, whether it be other streets, how do we kind of work and put together an objective methodology to bring to you and say, here's how we rated these? Um, because sometimes streets have a much more aggressive uh, citizen outreach. And myself, I've been out to Luther Oaks twice to meet with the people and talk about. But sometimes Lafayette Street, we have a lot of businesses out there. They once in a while will call in, but there's they're also in a similar situation. So with that, let me have Jim just talk a little bit about some of the unique characteristics of Lutz or Lutz Road and some of the other streets we're still looking at as part of a very informal five-year plan. Thank you, City Manager Hales. Uh, you are correct, uh, City Manager is correct in saying that it is one of the streets that is under consideration. We, it's been on our radar uh, for a number of years. The difficulty comes, and we've addressed this before with the Council, that we're looking at that high level, very high level prioritization, kind of that 20-year plan for how we go about assessing these types of roads. Because, for example, with Lutz Road, we're looking at $2.5 million to upgrade um, Morris Avenue, the, the remainder down to Lutz, and then Lutz over to the west, over to the, the over to where Greenwood starts to turn. That's a lot of funds uh, to be expended. The ADT on that road currently is 350 vehicles. Um, to put that into perspective with some of our other roads we're looking at, Fox Creek Road Bridge project we've talked about has 9,000 ADT. Uh, the projected ADT on our Hamilton Bunda Commerce uh, would be 15,000 ADT. I'm not standing here saying that's the only criteria by which you make judgment calls. It's important for you, know, though, to know as a council that it those type of factors, we have a lot of need out there, and we have to keep all of that into perspective. Um, we have looked, and we've been trying to work with Luther Oaks as well on other alternatives. Um, any other thing that we can, as a, as a staff, can do, uh, both from a street lighting perspective, maybe that we can uh, add street lighting to be able to help that community, uh, that area out. Um, it is a 16-foot road at this time, 16-foot wide road. 
uh, with shoulders that do need to be maintained. That's one of the things that we're going to be in the near future trying to bring to the council in a, a city county agreement, hopefully, that addresses and allows us to maintain partner with the county to maintain some of our gravel shoulders. Um, all that being said, uh, staff still is, is coordinating with their alderman, Alderman Sage, to meet with them and, and still try to talk through other ways that we can we can help them in the and it may be a short term. Uh, but again, this is a very long-term solution that uh, is, is difficult with our current resources. Okay, <clears throat> now we'll go ahead and move on. Um, I'll just mention, uh, as I normally do, just remind everybody there is a Liquor Commission meeting at uh, 4 o'clock tomorrow. <clears throat> uh, probably th the only thing that the Council might have some interest in, in is the development of a proposed text amendment on video gaming cap parlors or cafes. I think the council had <clears throat> informally kind of asked that we advance some uh, uh, an ordinance, proposed ordinance to uh, regulate that and we will be discussing that tomorrow um, and, and possibly moving on that. Uh, moving a little bit more slowly is a discussion of, of server training. Uh, we've had a, uh, a proposed ordinance out there. Um, I personally think that we need to back off on that a little bit. We're trying to arrange, make sure that the training is available before we require it. And we want to be very reasonable um, for Bassett training requirements. So we are looking for input from um, the licensees. Uh, I think we'll bring something forth. Um, we're just not ready to do that yet. Um, so that's all I had. Any uh, Alderman, uh, have a comment, Jim? Just two quick comments, Mayor. Uh, first one, with regard to server trainer, you know, I don't think we have to wait until the City Council wants to mandate something. I would sure get the message out that uh, voluntary participation, whether it's online or whether it's through Heartland or whatever the case might be, I mean, it seems like our discussion is going that direction. So, in a way, I'd like to say, why wait until something's thrust upon you? I mean, there's a lot of people with Bassett training and on a voluntary basis. So my little plug for encourage people to do it. In the meantime, uh, there is there are advantages for classroom versus online, but you got to start somewhere. Secondly, uh, do you have any plans to fill a one or more vacancy on the liquor commission? Um, yeah, I've been preoccupied with another appointment the last week or two, uh, but. There is a possibility. I'm trying to look at somebody. The council's been talking about more emphasis on enforcement, so I have a couple of applicants that um, that might help uh, with that. Thank Rob, I have three things. Uh, the first one is a group of four of us went to Pontiac to uh, look at the tourism that is occurring there, so that we could sort of import some of it for here. And it, it turned out that uh, there was an unintended uh, benefit on top of that. We found out that in Pontiac, when a retail location in the downtown is vacant, the city moves in and starts to offer to pay the rent on that space, and it moves in uh, local artists to show their wares and operate out of that retail space until the owner can actually rent that space. So it, for not very much money on the rent, the uh, artist pays for you know, utilities and so forth, the, the town town looks a lot more full or less empty. Uh, interesting program and I've talked to the city manager about it and it, it looks like something that we should at least look at uh, as a possibility. In the past, uh, when I was on the Uniquely Bloomington Commission, our office did that. Uh, we located somewhere, and as soon as the owner was able to rent our space, we moved somewhere else. And when he was able to rent that space, we moved somewhere else. So in the four and a half years I served on that commission, we had three different locations. It worked out pretty darn well. Uh, so that was a, a benefit of traveling to another community and trying to see what they do uh, on tourism, and we come back with uh, not only that, but some other information. Uh, the second thing I have is... I think sometimes we have to celebrate the things we do right. And recently the city manager shared information about how profitable Frontier Airlines has been 
uh, the number I think was over three hundred thousand dollars. We were asked to vote to put a hundred thousand dollars of city money out there as part of a I think is almost five hundred thousand dollar letter of credit that if they didn't earn enough money that we would reimburse them in order to attract them. Uh, the fact that they have been very profitable means we didn't have to use any of our money and we actually attracted them and I'm fairly sure we would not have had we not given them that guarantee. Now at the time that hundred thousand dollars was possible that we would have to use it. But also uh, to maintain the 15 percent discount that our citizens and our companies have on airfares which is actual because of our central location and because of our uh, number of flights in and out and because we have free parking, which now obviously Peoria copied, uh, we had over $800,000 in savings to our corporations and over $600,000 in savings to those of us individuals who fly. So the decision was, would we spend $100,000 to have our companies and citizens save 1.4 million. Uh, obviously we voted for it, it wasn't unanimous, but we did vote for it, and it helps us keep our airline viable. And I think we should celebrate the fact that we made a good decision, it didn't cost us any money, and we have saved our companies and citizens a million four hundred thousand dollars. My third item is uh, just something for all of us to consider. Uh, we had 10 people who wanted to speak tonight. We, by our policy, allow five. And rather than just drawing names out of a hat, I would think that we would want to give people who've never spoken before first priority and let the people who speak on a regular basis uh, speak if there is room. But that's just me. Uh, I just think we ought to consider that. Thank you. Karen. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome Alderman Matthew and please ask you do not clap Alderman Sage on the shoulder because we've missed him and it's good to have you back. Um, David, could you make just a couple of comments about um, the lighting at Harwood Place? I think that there's a, a, a sense that maybe the city was being very dictatorial about that and I, and I think you know, it, you were more on a listening tour, and, and so I, I just kind of want to make sure that everybody's got the full picture of, of what that meeting was about, because we did get some emails about it. Yeah, I'd be happy to. That that neighborhood meeting was, was designed, and the agenda and everything, and as we conducted the meeting, was very much uh, to listen to what the residents desired. What would there be their hopes on any plan to address uh, the very old and the very unsafe uh, situation we have with wiring of those old street lights. We definitely wanted to treat this as a listening session. There was no staff recommendations. In fact, in the PowerPoint we listed there's a number of options. And before we even begin a detailed analysis, we wanted to hear from them what would be their hopes. Uh, and. Uh, then when I saw the article in the pantograph, uh, that's when I contacted the city editor because they made it out that there was a debate, uh, the, the city and the residents were at odds and that was not the case because there was no, you know, city staff, here's our recommendation, what do you think about it? It, it was very much, uh, tell us first, you know, in a very proactive, upfront uh, way what input do you want to give us before we start any kind of detailed analysis? And we threw all the options up there for them. So uh, uh, the, uh, the editor felt that there were some valid points. They did run a correction on that. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the hope would be is going forward, we'll get uh, more, uh, more hopefully, uh, uh, consideration for when we're trying to just ask first up front for citizen input, it is not characterized incorrectly as I believe that article was was in the pantograph. So thanks for asking. Jay. Well, th since it's come up, um, I think you know the Harwood uh, situation is one that I've been very deeply involved in for two years, 
And in fact, we had a meeting, David, you and I, and David Bike and Jim and some other people, what was it, a year ago, and talked about more meetings. Um, and I do appreciate your apology that I was not invited or informed about that meeting. I truly appreciate that because it was a shock to me to see it on the website and to be informed by some other citizens. Um, <clears throat> the Harwood situation is a complicated one, but here's my, my take, having worked very closely with the residents and with David Bike and knowing virtually every single one of them. What they want is very simple, and David laid it out clearly in the article, which is a restoration of their streetlights, not a reproduction, not new lights. Um, David did a great deal of work, and he actually came up with some even bids because David's vocation or whatever is restoration, and he's very, very good at it, and he's done some marvelous things with houses throughout the east side. So he had gotten some bids on restoring the poles, and then it came down to the lights. And our suggestion was that we work with the local electric or several companies, get bids, and, and make it happen to fix those lights. So the, the, if there is a dispute, it's been a very simple one, that the block wants restoration, absolutely does not want to lose those original lights. And what we've heard is a lot of talk, and, and now we've hired Farnsworth, you know, to do a cost analysis a bid for some $4,000 when what David was hoping for and the block was hoping for, because they have contacted me that they are, nothing has changed with what they want. Um, is that it's too bad that two years ago when all this started, you know, we couldn't have simply obtained some bids. We couldn't have simply restored the poles. And finally, the last thing is now, you know, I, I, two years later, I, I'm not sure just where we are, but I hope to, I hope to find out. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is the country club lights that came out um, were saved by the city, and that's really a good thing. I mean, what could make more sense than saving one light pole to restore another one. Um, it, it saves the originals, it helps Harwood Place, everybody's happy. Um, and I'd really like to find out what happened to the bulbs, because those bulbs in the Country Club lights are critical. And according to Lash Electric, the bulbs were delivered to the city intact. I, I don't know where they are. But it would be nice if we could use you know, the parts from the country club lights to restore the Harwood lights. And I, I, I just don't have anything else to say except that I thought the pantograph quoted David accurately. The residents uniformly and all want restoration. They're, they never wanted any kind of new lights. They still don't. And I, I think it's unfortunate that we couldn't just move ahead with some bids and you know make it happen that way. Thank you. Let me just answer, you know, make uh, one neighbor doesn't speak for everyone on the street. Uh, up until our neighborhood meeting, yes, we had heard from David Bike and Alderman Stearns, but we did not hear from the rest of the neighborhoods. We felt just like in the Franklin Park playground, it was important to hear from everyone. Uh, and uh, respectfully, it is not so simple. We do not have experience with uh, looking at the life cycle costing for refurbishing and recasting these types of lights. As you know, in the strategic plan, we're, trying, we're supposed to look at what is the best value when we expend taxpayer funds for any kind of public improvement, whether it be street lights, sidewalk, and so forth. So there is definitely a question as to what is the lowest cost uh, for the uh, to hopefully get, get long-term wear and tear of streetlights of this nature, and it's an unknown to us. Hence, we need to kind of properly evaluate that, and then in our next meeting, we'll take that back to all the neighborhoods uh, and share that with them to help them not only understand that, you know, here's what the costs are coming into, but these are the costs that the council's going to want to look at, and is it, you know, is there differences from a cost, from an estimated life of the improvements, and that's something we want to go back and share with all the neighbors, not just one person. Okay, thank you. Other comments from council members?
Okay, seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you.